This is an ER diagram that focuses on employee and its subclasses. Now it looks really complicated, but that's because this particular ER diagram has three different kinds of subclassing going on. It has subclassing by role. So an employee could be a secretary, a technician, or an engineer. It has this subclass that says that some of the employees might be a manager. And it has a third subclassing having to do with how employees are paid. Some employees are hourly, some are salaried. The first thing to notice in this diagram are the pitchforks. This is a new symbol. We haven't seen this kind of line before. The pitchforks indicate I am a subclass of something. And the pitchforks always point towards the superclass. You can read the pitchforks as is a, because a pitchfork says a secretary is an employee, a technician is an employee, an engineer is an employee. Now, these pitchforks do not go directly to the superclass employee, but rather they go to a circle with a D in it. The D stands for disjoint. And what that means is that the subclasses cannot overlap. They have to be separate from one another. So for example, you could be a secretary or you could be a technician, but you could not be both. You could not be a secretary by day and a technician by night. You have to be one or one of the others. If in fact you could have an employee that has more than one of these roles, then you would have to change that circle. You'd have to change it from a D and you would actually put an O in the circle. The O stands for overlapping. We'll see an example of that coming up. But that's what these circles mean. This is why these subclasses do not have their pitchforks directly going to the superclass. What we're saying is we need to understand the relationship between the subclasses. Specifically, could an individual be a member of more than one subclass simultaneously or not? So the question is, why subclass at all? And as you can see from this diagram, the three subclasses of secretary, technician, and engineer have all been selected to be subclasses because each of them have a unique field. For secretaries, it's the typing speed. That does not apply to any other kind of employee, but it does apply to our secretaries. For technicians, it's their T grade or technician grade. Again, that's an attribute that only applies to the subclass technician. And then for engineers, it's the engineering type. Are they electrical engineers, mechanical engineers? And again, an attribute that's specific to the subclass. So because these subclasses have unique attributes, it was important to show them on the EER diagram. But I have a question for you. Does this mean that our company is only made up of secretaries, technicians, and engineers? And the key to answering that question has to do with the line between the superclass and the disjoint symbol. Notice that line is a single line. A single line, as we recall from ER diagrams, means partial participation. That's really important in this diagram. So what this means is that not every employee has to be one of those three subclasses. There are probably other subclasses of employees that don't have anything unique about them. Maybe the CEO of the company, we don't have to have any attributes on that person or the human resources staff. So it's only these three roles that have unique attributes. This is why in an EER diagram, you don't have to have every possible subclass, only the ones that have some special meaning. And that's why we have this partial participation line. Here is a different and totally separate subclassing of employee. This subclassing is based on how the employee is paid like the previous example, we have a salaried employee 
and we have an hourly employee as subclasses primarily because they have their own unique fields. For salaried employee, I store the salary differently than I do for an hourly employee where I store the pay scale. So this is an example of why I would subclass. And like the roles before, we have the two pitchforks merging into a D for disjoint. This means that an employee can either be salaried or they can be hourly. Here there's a difference though. Look at the line between the superclass and the disjoint symbol. It is a double line. And the double line means total participation. This means that the only way we can pay employees is by salary or hourly. We can't pay by commission. We can't have volunteer employees. Every single employee participates in that subclassing. And so every single employee must be either salaried or hourly. You will note another reason to subclass by the way we pay employees. And that is because the hourly employees engage in a special relationship with trade unions. And this way, we can be really precise in our data model. A salaried employee can't be in a union, only the hourly employees. So this way, it gives us the chance to link trade unions to a subclass of employees. In this way, we cannot accidentally enroll a salaried employee into a trade union. The other thing I wanted to mention again was that these subclasses, these three different trees, are totally independent. We could have a technician who's hourly. We could have a technician who's salaried. It doesn't matter. These are independent ways to look at the subclassing of employees. Our final way to subclass employees is that some employees are managers. And because of that, we have this manager subclass. Now notice in this case that there is no disjoint. That's because in this particular subclassing tree, there's only one subclass. You're either a manager or you're not. And if you're not a manager, you belong to the superclass. So we don't have the D. Our pitchfork goes directly into our superclass. Again, the reason to do this is that a manager manages projects. So you could say to yourself, do I really need the subclass manager? Why don't I just go up to the employee and draw another attribute asking whether the employee is a manager or not? And you could do this. But again, just like the hourly employees in the trade unions, if I do identify in the database some employees as managers, then I can enforce this relationship. So again, a regular employee would be unable to manage a project, but a manager would. So sometimes subclassing is important to enforce certain relationships. As you recall, the reason we subclass in the first place is because we either have unique attributes of the subclasses or because the subclass engages in a unique relationship. So this breaks down our employee EER diagram. And I hope this explains some of the concepts in EER diagramming. We'll talk about a few more in upcoming videos.